Hello, everybody. We are uh, excited to join you. How I, I hope that uh, day two of the National Federation of Families Annual Conference has gone, gotten off to a good start for you. We're very excited to be here calling in from uh, Massachusetts to tell you about the Family Centered Pediatric Integrated Care model that we're testing out here. Um, I want to introduce my team. <laughs> alerted you. Um, I'm, I am Catherine Grimes. I'm the founder and director of the Children's Health Initiative at Cambridge Health Alliance. And our mission, which is somewhat wordy, is to inform children's mental health policy by identifying evidence-based strategies for improving healthcare access and engagement among vulnerable populations at risk for outcome disparities. And sort of the short version of that is uh, we, we, we are very invested in finding kids who are, have high need and might not be known even to their families or certainly to their doctors, finding them and matching the need to appropriate individualized treatment and hoping that that leads to better outcomes. Kid by kid, if we add that up, we're hoping that will be better outcomes for populations at risk. But we start with just the kid, individual kid and the individual family. With me today, I have my dream team, um, Lindsay Dubana at LICSW. She's our clinical director for the Children's Health Initiative and supervises the clinical social workers on the, on the uh, safety net program that we're gonna tell you about. Karen Martinez is our family support specialist director and she supervises the family support specialists. And uh, running the show behind the scenes is Jen McNaval, our uh, program administrator. The learning objectives uh, may look a little different than the ones you guys have. Um, we tweak them just a bit, but the, um, the first and most prominent objective is to um, talk to you about the role of family support specialists, something we've crafted um, here to meet our particular needs. It's a, a role for a peer-to-peer -peer parent with lived experience caring for children with mental health needs, but within a pediatric integrated care setting. And Karen Martinez is going to tell you more about what that looks like in real life. Um, and we also hope that you learn how our safety net model works, including a specialized role of the clinical care manager in creating a clinically informed, coordinated care plan together with families, primary care, schools, agencies, natural support, and community-based resources. So first of all, backing up to the um, bigger picture within the United States, uh, the most recent studies that we have are being reflected here. And it just as a, um, an asterisk, I'll say that if we were doing studies starting today, I think these numbers that are already concerning would be a lot more concerning because we all are aware that uh, COVID has brought more stress to families and some of that is showing up in more mental health needs with, for kids. But at the time this, this was done pre-COVID, um, on average, out of every 100 children, up to 20 met criteria for mental illness. So that would be the, the light green on the far right of your screen, including the dark blue ones. Um, the dark blue ones represent the kids out of those kids. So that's already a lot of kids. If you figure you invited five kids over for a sleepover, one of those kids would, by this um, estimate, which is already out, somewhat outdated, would be uh, likely to have serious mental illness. So that's pretty frequent. But of those um, 20 kids, that same study showed that only four of them actually got a mental health evaluation. So it's, it was a very worrisome situation of mismatch between need and resources back at this point. And as I said, it's, it's only um, gotten worse. In addition, we also know that um, many times people might come in for just one um, visit. And um, so even when they come in for an evaluation in our usual care situations, um, that might be it. They don't, and even if treatment is available, they don't necessarily take advantage of it, the families, the kids. And there are many reasons for that. Um, many barriers to engagement that have been studied already um, regarding language, culture, geography, um, that can get in the way of treatment utilization, even when there is treatment available. In terms of barriers to care, um, the premature termination of services can lead to significant under-treatment. And I think um, 
I've heard this story from so many parents, I'm sure that many of you in the audience will recognize that thing where someone says, oh, my, my pediatrician said that the child will grow out of it, or my mother said the child will grow out of it or something, and uh, people don't get treatment as soon as, um, as we might wish. Um, they also are um, at risk of having a increasing severity of illness the longer that it goes untreated and that leads then to um, uh, worrisome uh, outcomes. But the focus, while sometimes uh, is primarily placed on, um, on the consumer, the patient, the client, the person that's not coming in, um, we also try to think about this as a fit between caregivers and families and, and that that's a two-way street and, and that um, children and caregivers leave treatment for a reason. We, we may or may not uh, agree with their reason, but there's a reason and we need to understand what's getting in the way and, and adjust the provider side, the clinician side, as well as the um, talking to families about what's going on on their side. And along with that, if providers are not culturally sensitive and the setting is not supportive, one of the problems with that is that key information may not be shared by the child or the caregiver with with the team, and that's very limiting. Um, it, not sharing that information can, uh, through the either cultural divides or misunderstandings, can lead to incorrect diagnoses and treatment plans, which are also then not likely to be endorsed by the family. So I know lots of doctors who will think their job is done because they made recommendations. And, and uh, what our team tries to do is to make sure the recommendations are made jointly with um, the family and the youth and, um, and that there's opportunity to adjust and adjust and tweak and, and check back so that they are gonna be plans that people will actually um, try out and see if they work or not and not just go away and say, well, I'm never doing that. Um, parents and or caregivers often have a great trust in their pediatricians or PCPs. And uh, we found that leveraging that relationship helps with Again, reaching the 80% of kids with mental health needs who currently are not getting care. Early recognition of symptoms and supportive expectations from primary care regarding um, the family's participation in the child mental health evaluation, which we've seen with our physician partners where they really are um, enthusiastically encouraging the family to see us. And in, in my uh, view, that is literally saving lives. The safety net approach that the full name of our grant that we currently have is weaving a community-based system of care to improve child mental health outcomes. And this is the um, latest version of the wor of work we've been doing for almost a decade now at Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, uh, my team worked with directly with primary care pediatrics starting in 2012 as the first um, pediatric Integrated Care Initiative at Cambridge Health Alliance and has had a series of opportunities, which we're grateful to both private and, um, and federal found funders to expand our model, to study it, to uh, refine it. The current iteration is funded by SAMHSA um, and is intentionally focused on youth with adverse childhood experiences ACEs, for those of you who are used to that terminology, um, kids who are at risk for childhood trauma. Grant that we got is a four-year SAMHSA-funded um, research study or program um, aimed at disrupting child mental health outcome disparities. Safety Net team combines individualized peer-to-peer -peer family support with specialty child mental health resources. Together with the PCP, the Safety Net team works to uh, clarify diagnoses, and promote family engagement in care delivery, as I just talked about, um, as well as to improve access to customized mental health services. For example, a simple one, a seemingly simple, at least challenge, not a simple challenge to solve, is that uh, we have many families who do not have English as a first language, and when we can find a mental health resource, it might be only available from a provider that is English speaking. So we end up having to figure ways around that. Many examples. 
Um, and we also work to intervene on behalf of children at risk of childhood trauma and or serious emotional This is our um, little graphic here, somewhat complicated, but the idea is that we start on the left so that the, the child and uh, a parent or family member brings the child to primary care. Either they have a concern already, the parent or the kid, maybe an older kid voices a concern or the pediatrician or family medicine doc observes something that they're concerned about um, that represents a mental health or substance use disorder or other uh, social risk. At that point, um, a referral is made to our team. The Safety Net Child and Family Team Evaluation is, is launched, um, assuming the referral goes through. And that, that consists of a lot of things happening at the same time. And one of the things we were trying to display, hard to know whether it's visually accessible uh, to everyone the same way, but is that these are things that are happening at the same time. And uh, I think what many of us are used to is even if you do have more than one um, team member address uh, working on mental health or, or another issue, um, hip pain, it could be anything, uh, we typically in medicine split that up. So you have an appointment one day with uh, this person, you have an appointment another day with another person. Uh, and we try to really meet families uh, together side by side and really emphasize the degree to which we are, it's a team effort. So we, we have, um, and we really work to be responsive in, in a timely way um, because we know that the longer that families wait, uh, the urgency can sometimes fade and we might miss seeing them all together. The family uh, support specialist about whom you'll hear more, um, assesses the family needs and strengths. The child psychiatrist identifies uh, psychiatric needs and the uh, clinical care manager evaluates child and family functioning and identifies uh, appropriate resources. All of this rolled up leads to um, what we, our sort of mantra, which is shared goals, shared plan, and shared outcomes. The safety net process, as I would say, is multidisciplinary involving the CCM and FSS. The youth and parent may be seen individually and or together as appropriate to age and circumstances of the child um, with child psychiatry consultation. The interview findings um, are exchanged and discussed among the safety net team. Um, then the observations, diagnoses, and treatment ideas are, are also shared with the referring primary care clinician all of this gets kind of rolled up in, a, uh, in, a, in recommendations that um, are further discussed with the youth and family. The, we consider our recommendations are not um, official until they've been discussed and uh, possibly modified but or, or agreed upon with the youth and family. So there's then a shared treatment plan and, uh, and clear next steps in place prior to the end of the, of the evaluation session. So next, I'm going to uh, invite Lindsay Devana to talk to you more about the, um, about the clinical collaboration strategies in the state. All right, so hi, uh, my, my name is Lindsay Devana. I uh, am a licensed clinical social worker and the clinical director for our safety net study. I'm really excited to be here with you all today and, and very excited to be working on the safety net study. Um, I've worked on a few different integrated care projects before this. Um, so let's dive in. The safety net model. So our referrals come directly from primary care and build upon the deep clinical histories and the trusting relationships that PCPs have with kids and their families. Uh, we consider this a big head start on the knowledge at the, on, at the outset um, of a referral compared to typically sort of scant office-based outpatient referral info. So we have, we have a lot of uh, important information going into to meeting a family. Being consultants to the PCP offers us a unique opportunity to increase comfort levels among culturally diverse patient populations regarding meeting mental health providers, um, sometimes for the first time, sometimes um, they've met so many mental health providers, um, they, they sort of lack, they lack faith in um, the systems of care. And 
this gives us a big head start in engagement where we're in a familiar place where families are used to getting um, their primary care. Next slide. Although po population-based pediatric screening is required here in Massachusetts as a result of a, a class action lawsuit, child mental health referrals are typically made um, based upon a PCP's clinical judgment. Um, being able to work directly with our PCPs, clarify what they are noticing with a child and how they hope we can help really gets us pointed in the right direction and, and gives us excellent momentum right from the start. Next slide. Uh, we, we have threefold goals for our uh, safety net evals. Um, we are trying to identify the needs and strengths of a family, ac assess the mental health status and diagnosis of a child. Um, and our evaluations include both formal mm -hmm. clinical mm -hmm. assessments, and these are the child and adolescent functional assessment scale, as well as children, the children's global assessment scale, which is a, um, a global scale, um, as well as a baseline trauma screener. And we are using the, the PEARLS, um, which is the Pediatric ACEs Screening and Related Life Events Screener. We collect data at, at three different time intervals at baseline six and, and 12 months. All right. So our clinical care manager position is our, our social workers on our team and they are considered the, the site-based team leader. Um, they facilitate communication with patients and among safety net team members, including PCPs. So a whole lot of communicating. They coordinate information sharing and treatment planning as appropriate with teachers, child welfare workers, mental health providers, and um, an array of informal supports. They make referrals for follow-up clinical services. And, and uniquely, I think in our study, we're really looking at clinical services both for the child and the parent. Um, and, and so we're, we're working with, with both those service systems. Uh, in, in order to, to communicate with, with all these folks, it, it feels like we have to exist in multiple spaces simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, one of those spaces is our primary care clinics, where space can be challenging to find, definitely, but seems really essential to accessibility and also building relationships. Um, it makes us available for informal consults, warm handoffs, and in-person evals and, and follow-up communication. We, we did had, have to make a pandemic pivot from a, a primary care clinics um, in, a, in a sort of a, a legendary day. <laughs> uh, in March of 2020, we converted our sort of entire um, service delivery system to telehealth. Um, and it, I think it took every, everybody on the team um, and, and it was very memorable, but um, maybe we'll have time to talk more about it in terms of the pros and cons to telehealth for our population and, and what we learned about during that process. We also exist in the electronic medical record, which really has allowed for efficient communication with both child and adult providers, again, with those sort of two generation home model and the opportunity to tailor communication to match providers' needs um, with, their, with their busy workloads. Um, it has allowed us access to developmental and clinical histories as well as future appointments um, and challenges do exist in the EMR because again, they're not organize, organized around families and so it's not always clear which chart should hold what, what information about family about families. We also exist in the community. Um, we're available to families in their homes, in the community, which includes school, child welfare, and other important meetings that we attend, um, as well as virtually um, from in our pandemic pivot. Um, we provide ongoing individualized case consultation to an array of community providers. Um, and it has allowed us case by case to really build um, a network of providers uh, that we, we can rely on, that they can rely on us um, in terms of, of building relationships. I think one of the keys to the collaborative practice model is um, having these multimodal communication efforts. 
They allow us enough flexibility to really digest these complex clinical presentations and family circumstances while still maintaining forward progress um, and enough endurance and stamina to support follow through with treatment recommendations. Um, so th th those have served to be keys for us. And I think something else notable about our model, that the relationship and the partnership between the, clinic, the child mental health clinician and the peer-to-peer -peer parent professional, they, we work side by side with families. Um, and this has created some shared responsibility and, and shared benefits, I think, which are to allow multiple opportunities to re-engage with difficult to reach families. <laughs> Um, and uncover barriers to treatment at the onset. The two perspectives um, seem very needed throughout the, the engagement part and, and reduces burnout by sharing the challenges of taking care of children and families with high mental health acuity. Um, cultivating continuity of intent is, is extremely important to, to our work. The CCM and the FSS work together and separately to create a shared understanding of the strengths and the needs of the family and the child. They actively follow up with the child and the caregiver, as well as each member of the larger team to build a cohesive, family-driven and individualized care plan with clearly defined goals. This continuity of intent reduces confusion or conflict about recommendations and clarifies roles and action steps. Continuity of intent also allows for a shared understanding of what has been achieved uh, and can be celebrated and what is still needed um, to work on. Oh. oh, no, I'm, I'm good to go. All right, so we'd love to start by uh, sharing a case with you guys. So this is, uh, there's just a delay, I'll look here. Um, this is a case of a 12-year-old female of El Salvadorian descent. Um, the mother reported to the PCP that um, that this, this patient does not leave her room or go out of the house, um, was doing poorly with remote learning, had a poor appetite and seemed isolated from her friends. So that was the referral that we received. We had noted in the chart that this child had been referred for services on two different occasions um, in 2017 and 2019, but was never seen. And, and that is frequently something that we see in our referrals that kids have been referred for, but didn't but didn't make it to any um, form of care. Um, this, uh, in our evaluation, we discovered that um, our patient had a, a history of sexual abuse and, and personal exposure to racism, which gave her an A score of a two. Um, and she had a CAFIS score of 40, which is our clinical functioning measure that we are using. So again, would you kind of see it unmute? You have to mute. Um, I just want to apologize again for the unanticipated interruption of the, of the fire alarm system. I'm glad we're all safe from fire, but we're glad to get reunited for you guys, with you guys. In terms of this case, um, I wanted to take a, a minute just to see if we could hear some thoughts from you. And in, in, when we were picturing doing this in person, we were picturing going table to table and getting your input. But of course, we can't quite do that remotely. Um, so I guess to, um, if you, ideally, if you use the Zoom chat, that's the system we're mostly using, um, if that works for you where you are, to, it'd be interesting to get your ideas or, um, yeah, that's probably the best way, to, about what you already, um, uh, what, what thoughts you already have about hearing that brief presentation about the child and family and what else you would wanna know. So let me just see if I can. Scroll down, the check, and Jen, you're also checking, right? If anybody has any things to tell us. Um, give folks a minute to decide. Um, but it's also, you can just kind of have that question floating out there. And um, it'll be interesting to see, um, think about that, and we'll add some thoughts from Karen. Oh, here's some, I have to change glasses for this. And what does it say, Jen? The description about current behavior seems as if it would be much more widespread now. Oh, okay. Yes. 
Um, so we had a uh, a thought that um, that the risks are broader now for those the presentation, like for example, that sexual abuse, um, and another, someone else talking about um, uh, the family demonstrating a strength for Evi asking for help, which we completely agree with. <laughs> so I'm going to set that. That's a perfect segue to uh, hear what um, Karen you would add at this point as a family support specialist. Good afternoon. Um, well, this particular case, um, the family support specialist had a, a, a moment, a time to meet with the parents separately. And um, she definitely was wanting to say something and was very mistrusting at that point um, and asked many, many questions. But this parent came to the USA because of violence towards mother's extended family in El Salvador. And, both parents uh, were seeking asylum and worried about having any legal problems that would jeopardize this process. And I think that's, you know, the main reason why she was just mistrusting at that point. And during the evaluation, um, after we split up and family support had time, uh, mother um, revealed that the daughter had been sexually abused for two years by the pastor's son. Uh, the abuse stopped during the pandemic um, and child reveal, revealed as to the older sibling um, who told the parents. Um, uh, mom and dad were super worried about her uh, presentation because she was depressed and isolated and worried if filing charges would put the family at even more risk of deportation. So parents um, had a commitment to their leadership role in the church as well and had a long-term relationship with the pastor. Okay. That's you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm um, just uh, pausing again to get your thoughts um, as, as you heard that additional information provided by the family support specialist. So you've heard the uh, more clinically crisp description of how, how this uh, family came to clinical attention from Lindsay. And then you heard that sort of additional backstory, additional flavor uh, from Karen. So I'm thinking for clinicians that might be in this audience, um, what intervention might you be thinking of taking at this point if you were presented with the story well, in the setting you're currently working in? And if you're a family member, not that those are incompatible because you could be both, but what intervention do you think the family might be expecting? Um, you know, what did they think they were going to get when they came? Uh, and then what kind of help do you think the family would be hoping for? Because those are not always the same. I'm just going to see if we get any... Um, Thoughts about that while Lindsay gets ready to pick the thread back up here. And what we saw, Lindsay, before is it took a second, of course, for people to get their thoughts. But um, let's see. Do you know, I didn't check the other chat function. I you think. We just told everybody to use Zoom. Uh, yeah, I think so. I guess we'll, we'll, oh, there's some, you could read them. Oh, I mean, should I, yeah, yes, thank yeah, you. That was a polite way of telling you. It's just polite. Okay, I got it. So I'm just, I'm seeing um, two, two chat uh, postings that this description of current behavior seems as if it would be could be much more widespread now. Um, yeah, we talked about that one. So okay. I, I know okay, there is not more okay. at this point. All right, yeah. so you go ahead. Okay. So in terms of our interventions after taking taking on this case, it, during our evaluation, we received an, an important disclosure of the, the sexual abuse. Um, this had, was the first time this, this child, uh, this parent had shared this with any provider. Um, and so it, it, it definitely seemed like her relationship with the primary care clinic and, and the 
primary care um, doctor and our relationship with the clinic were, were part of that, perhaps. Um, we pretty quickly were able to get um, therapy services started for this child, um, which, which was somewhat lucky. And we, again, used our established relationship uh, with, um, with, with an intake service to be able to, to get something started pretty quickly. Um, we supported this parent with the complicated immigration concerns. When the abuse disclosure came, uh, there, the, the ongoing um, therapist did uh, involve child protective services, um, which created a potentially a complicated um, immigration scenario for this parent and, and how to navigate these, the family's needs, the child's needs, um, as well as um, this, this system that was put into play with the child protection services. We had ongoing consultation um, with child protection, which um, as well as the child service providers. And I do think that ongoing consultation with a therapist who, who happened to be a, um, an, an intern was, uh, was crucial in, in the therapist being able to maintain a relationship um, and, and a consistent and, and engaging one at that. Um, we were also able to take this new disclosure and modify the, the family safety plan and, and make sure that the family was um, really um, uh, on board um, with making sure that there were no other, as much as is possible, sort of buffering any, any further ACEs for this child. So the FSS intervention at that point, um, we empathetically uh, continue to build a trusting relationship uh, to support in the cultural competency um, and just understanding um, in what uh, was important in her uh, culture, especially with this situation um, and what was normal in her culture, especially with this situation. Um, family support uh, did lots of frequent phone, phone check-ins with the parent and we also um, reviewed the safety planning and if anything came up, uh, we would definitely share that with the team and um, helped her uh, navigate the um, crisis team in her native language as well. Uh, we guided the parent to obtain legal advice from the appropriate expert. She was asking uh, us a lot of questions, the family support, and we absolutely needed to stay within our role, um, but also um, support her as much as we, we could so she won't feel that she was alone with everything. So that's something that was super important. Um, we continued active communication and collaboration with the clinical team members, um, just uh, just uh, providing updates, uh, either written or um, through phone calls. I'm just sneaking a thing in that's not on your slide, which is um, to give an example of what Karen was talking about. Lindsay mentioned that uh, it was really important that this child had gotten connected with, um, successfully connected with a individual therapist with whom she built a nice relationship. Somewhere along in there, um, there the parent had some worries as everything was a little more nervous making about immigration and other things and um, as child protection was involved and um, and thought that maybe they would pull the child from that therapist and go find a different one. And um, that was a concern on the clinician side. Karen's team was able to take that information, go back to the mother and um, talk through what was in her, why was she thinking that would be a good idea? You know, what were her worries and really support her sticking it out with the therapist that, that the child was already very connected to and, and um, sneak, sneak peek, it remains connected to. So uh, that's an example of, of how that kind of more the, the high level language that the Karen was speaking about translates to a very just uh, tangible step that would not have been as possible if it had just been something the therapist was trying to handle. Or the, or the clinician on our team was trying to handle by themselves. 
Okay, Lindsay. Yeah, so happy to report the, these updates. Um, so this young person continues weekly outpatient therapy that was maintained um, through the Child Protective Investigation uh, and also maintained through this period of time where she showed uh, sort of a decrease in symptoms at the very, very beginning. And then, um, you know, I think sometimes families can drop out of treatment at that point and, and we kept sort of encouraging the engagement and things, you know, she did struggle a bit at times and, and was, I then had her ongoing therapist to, to talk to and engage with. Um, she's also engaged in an after-school volleyball program, which you know we're, we're finding is bringing her a lot of joy and, and positive peer um, relationships, which, which is, has been really important to her. And, and mom, I think on a sort of just reporting her, the family's function says that she's no longer isolating in her room and is coming out um, more to, to communicate with her family. So I think everyone's feeling the, the, the positive gain so far. So the um, update after meeting with the safety net, um, actually, next slide, please. Oh. This one? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, mother consulted with the immigration lawyer and explored her legal options at that point. Um, she was very, very scared. Um, and the family actually is now moving an hour away and her decision to do that, um, or both parents, I should say, was to keep the child safe and also to just have a new start. Um, but she wants to maintain a safety net. She, she's very grateful for the support that she received um, and she does want to continue with safety net even if she has a drive an hour. And we are excited to have her as well. So our second case, uh, the reason this this 11 year old male was referred to us with a history of ADHD, an ADHD diagnosis and extensive learning problems. Um, it was reported by his mom um, that he seemed paranoid after starting a recent stimulant medication. Um, and it was also noted in the referral that he lived primarily with his grandmother, um, but had recently started to visit with his mom again. Um, and so we, did, we didn't quite know about the, the extensive family history, but that's what we knew at referral. Um, the PCP had expressed concern about a possible underlying anxiety disorder. Um, when we saw this 11 year old for his evaluation, we did discover that he had a very high ACE score of, of a six that included parental substance abuse, parental mental illness, separation from a parent. He had been living with his grandparents um, for for almost the entirety of his life, neglect, family violence, and a caregiver, his grandparent, his, one of his grandparents with serious physical illness. Um, he had a slightly uh, higher CAFA score than uh, our, our last patient, but a whole lot of stress and sort of trauma in his history. Explain that higher and higher risk lower. So in, in the CAFA, this, this child functioning measure, um, a higher score is actually, um, sort of indicates higher functioning. Um, we, we got two, um, hold on. No, in the CAFIS, sorry, I'm confusing the CAFIS and the CGAS here, but our, our CAFIS measure, a higher score actually indicates um, sort of a worse level of functioning versus a, a lower score. So excited to hear you. Um, so here we are again, thinking about, okay, now you've heard from Lindsay, the clinical presentation and then some, even some clinical assessment numbers. Um, and it's a different story, obviously, different kind of family scenario. What I'm curious if anybody has an idea already in their head about this, this child or family. And, and if so, what else you would wanna, wanna know? So let us know if you do. Um, and while you're thinking about that, um, I'm going to have Karen talk to you a little bit about, well, then what happened now, remembering that we're doing this 
in real time. Lindsay might be in a different room with a family, uh, a kid, uh, while Karen's in a room with the parent, and they might get together or meet, meet both of them at the same time before and after that. So it's not happening you know, like two weeks later with a different appointment. It's all happening in, during the same evaluation. And we kind of learn what we learn as we go and make adjustments. Okay, Karen. So the maternal grandparents, um, they had major health issues. Uh, they cared for this child uh, due to bio mom's past substance abuse. The grandparents felt um, she was no longer, um, that the, the bio mother was no longer using and allowed the child to have overnight visits with bio mom and the boyfriend on the weekends. And uh, the um, grandparents' aim was reunification, especially because of her health. Um, so there had been family tension, um, arguments because of the different views in raising on this child. Um, and grandmother at some points felt disappointed and worried um, with mom's inconsistent involvement. Uh, so family support reached out to, to the mom uh, at one day. And actually family support uh, would connect with both uh, the bio mom and the grandparents. And one day the family support specialist reached out to mom and notices that uh, the bio mom had slurred speech and um, the family support keeps the parent on the call while connecting to the CCM in real time, which is the beauty of the work that we do. Um, so she was able to join in the call and do a clinical assessment right there, like I said, in real time of the parent's condition. Okay. Um, so, as we were saying before, you might have different thoughts um, from a clinical point of view about what else, uh, what, what you would do now, given the additional information that the FSS has brought in. Um, and again, if you are a person as a family member yourself or, rep or representing family members in your role at, at your employment, what intervention do you think the family might be expecting and what intervention do you think the family would be hoping for? Um, it would be, uh, I think that we ask ourselves as we go, um, Lindsay and I talk about this all the time, like what, okay, and, and also with Karen, what would a person, gee, would we have been able to do that, whatever we just did in usual care? It would have been, or would the system have been set up in such a way that we, we couldn't have done that turn on a dime, last minute, flexible reinvention of something that kept the family connected. Um, so it's one of our ongoing conversations internally as we try to figure out about sustainability and how realistic it is to think that the kind of work that we're doing can be just done across the country. Um, it, it, what's the What's the cost um, to making it possible? Or the stressors on um, administrative support, other and clinicians alike, in terms of making the um, kind of uh, right immediate right turns or uh, rerouting um, steps that we end up doing with these complex families. Okay, people are thinking about that, Lindsay, and I'm going to give you the next slide. Great. Um, so for case number two, in, um, for our intervention, one of the first um, and, and maybe a, a very crucial part of the intervention was untangling the family's custody arrangement. The, when we received the referral, the PCP had told us that the, the grandparents had custody. Um, however, we, we learned in meeting with the family that, that that was actually not made have been sort of assumed because the grandparents had been taking this 11 uh, year old to all of his medical appointments, but mom actually had retained custody even though she had not, she had not been the primary caregiver for, for pretty much his entire life. And so they had this sort of familial arrangement, but, um, but it, it wasn't reflective of, of sort of how they were, how they were functioning. And it became really important um, later on uh, to, to have to know the difference about who had the legal custody, um, we this family I, I think with a with a history of of trauma and substance use was very suspicious of providers um, and 
uh, really, we required um, really partnering with the PCP who they did trust in, in, ter in terms of being able to see them and, and for them to be engaged with our services. So we worked really hand in hand with the PCP, especially at the beginning of this case. Um, we consulted with child service providers, so uh, this 11-year-old already had a, had a psychiatrist that had seen him um, pretty infrequently, but at least was a, a, a provider working on the case, and so we, we definitely consulted with her. Um, we built individual, individual relationships with each of these caregivers, the adults, both mom and, and grandma, um, which which I think helped us not get in, get in, the, in the way of, of their sort of turmoil and their sort of lengthy history of tension, um, but was difficult. I think it required levels of, of supervision and support from, uh, from our staff because these were individual, these, these, um, these women were, could be sort of in, um, intense and reactive at times. Um, we ended up having to file a, a 51A, um, and I, Karen might say a bit more about that in the next slide, but um, she, uh, we, in a sort of a routine contact with the, with, with mom, um, our family support specialist picked up that mom sounded um, quite out of it and, and uh, also had said that we, we also knew that this child was coming to her house for a, an unsupervised weekend visit. Um, and so that the family support specialist and the clinical care manager were able to both be on the phone. The social worker could do an assessment of mom as, as best she could. Um, and we ended up getting child protective services involved because that child was literally, I think within an hour of arriving at that home. Um, and we found out um, from that investigation that happened that mom had been using for quite some time. Um, she'd been using fentanyl. Um, so it, it really was a, a, a sort of a, a lethal scenario. Um, uh, the family was quite upset when we um, when we fought, when we were able to get child protective services involved um, and had to because again of this immediate risk was was taking place um, and we I think because we had a history of relationship with the PCP and, and somewhat with this family really uh, were able to to stay in there and stay engaged and allow um, you know uh, allow the family to be quite angry and, and find sort of ways to come back and, and work with them again. Uh, and that again involved the PCP. Um, so I think that is intervention and, and I'm passing it off to Karen, I think. So in case I mentioned, sorry, the intervention, um, the family support specialists uh, continue persistent outreach uh, to both the maternal grandmother and to the child's mom. Um, she listened without blame or judgment uh, to the frustrated grandparents at that point and provided guidance uh, where needed. At, at one point, I do remember that grandparents said, I, I, I had no idea this was going on. Um, so uh, to being a, a little, a flare, uh, I, I would say, um, uh, we brought a grandparent's perspective at that point. What we did is we recruited a grandparent, um, um, which is me actually, in the uh, in, into the team and and um, just trying to talk to grandmother and just uh, just give her that perspective, from grandma to grandma. Um, we also, uh, the family support specialist in the case, uh, continued the outreach to the maternal grandmother, and she models commitment to the process, although the, the grandparent was upset, um, and commitment to the relationship and on and offering ongoing support if she felt she needed that that point. Back to you, Lindsay. So an update on our case that we've now worked for about, this was over the course of about six months in terms of this, this amount of work, that we do feel like this, this um, child safety has improved tremendously we, by uncovering his mother's active drug use. There was a change of custody that happened um, that, that was supported by our 
Child Protective Services here in Massachusetts. And so now the grandparents have formal custody um, and, and have signing power in terms of educational plans and medical decisions and, and all the important things. Um, mom has also been offered treatment of her own substance use treatment and, and has not engaged um, as of yet with that, but it, it, there has been uh, offerings, which, which is um, helpful. Um, and I think importantly, there's ongoing monitoring efforts from Child Protection Services um, of, his, of, this, of this guy's safety. Um, his PCP is now aware of, of concerns about his educational plan, um, our team's recommendations for, for therapy and supervised visits. Um, even though the, the family has decided not to continue to work with us at this point, um, there has been an awful lot of work done so far and, and the PCP that has worked with us the whole time is, is taking over the case again. And so there's a lot of continuity um, it, it, and a lot of um, sort of docking spots in terms of um, the information will be used with his care going forward. So at that point, the family support specialist maintain a neutral engagement, uh, although difficult. Um, uh, the grandparent did uh, disengage um, with both parents. Um, and who actually sometimes in see eye to eye, sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. And uh, despite of the confusion about who had legal custody of this child, um, they, they did try, they, they were a family who tried. Um, so the family support specialist outreach call allowed the team to discover that something was off with mom and the clinician alerted the PCP who was aware, unaware of the mother's serious substance use or the continuous use of substance abuse. So. I'm just jumping in to add a, a thought. That, um, we have the opportunity here that some of these PCPs actually see the parent and the child. So this is one of those instances where by un uncovering the um, parents' very serious substance use that you heard about from Lindsay and Karen, um, we were not only is the PCP being tasked uh, as we had, as we uh, closed on our end um, with keeping an eye on the kid, but they are also um, now aware that the that the mother who's also their patient is a um, it is an untreated, has an untreated substance use disorder with a very serious proportion. So that is a sad situation, but it does feel like an important um, contribution towards this potential of things getting better for the family. So I, there, there are no shortage of challenges. Um, these are a few that, that we've, we've come to know very well. So we being uh, one being being unknown in the the continuum of typical children's mental health services. So we're we're a consultation service, but not providing direct um, sort of more traditional therapy. And, and so that's taken some time to, uh, to for folks to know um, what what we do in the community. Um, number two, evaluations frequently reveal parents with unknown and untreated and sometimes very serious mental, mental illness, um, including psychosis. And so we have, we have had to work really hard to get adult services um, and, and to, it's been helpful to be able to recognize those needs in our families. Another challenge has been identifying urgent needs and then facing long wait lists for appropriate services. Um, it's been made even, you know, it was a problem before before COVID, it, you know, it, it became a, a much larger mountain to climb. Um, and so helping our families and, and having relationships in the community has helped a fair bit. Many caregivers um, also have severe and chronic health conditions, um, which uh, it may come with a, the history of, of trauma that is extensive in our families. Um, and so those, those health conditions are very real and, and affect um, caregiving and, and all sorts of, of family wellness. 
Um, and number five, adjusting from in-clinic care to COVID telehealth care um, was a significant um, challenge. And then most recently coming back to in-person care has been also its own set of challenges in terms of safety, scheduling, space. So on the operations, as well as clinical side, as well as sort of staff management, um, it's, been, it's been dynamic. You know, it, uh, in terms of opportunities that this work has sort of exposed and allowed, allowed us to have, um, we've been allowed to be ambassadors to mental health in primary care, um, to really respect primary care and, and, uh, and, and see what incredible work they're doing with their patients. Oh, we're gonna go back a few slides here. Um, we've, we've also, one of the opportunities that we've realized is you know, sometimes getting to the table is really important and it doesn't really matter how you get there and the table being, you know, invitations to important collateral meetings. Um, and so we've really used relationships. We've used um, sometimes, you know, I think at first when we were getting started and folks didn't know what we, we were doing, we didn't always get invited to things and, and somehow we would find a way to be in the know and just get there and, and through those experiences, we've been invited um, now very formally to things like inpatient psych meetings and, you know, educational meetings galore. Um, so we're, we're more well known now. We often need a two generation intervention. So we've talked about this with, with our cases, but have needed supports for both adults and, and kids. Um, so we've gotten to know what are resources available for our parents. Um, We've learned to anticipate seasonal and pandemic strain treatment capacity gaps. So while we're really key on finding services that meet the needs of a particular individual patient in front of us, we, we try to get a sense of what's available in the community. So when those needs present themselves, we, we can sort of know what resource might work. Um, and we, we build strong relationships, um, both with our families and, and also our fellow providers that we're working with. We share successes um, and we sort of, as, as Karen's taught me to celebrate um, and it makes, I think it makes folks more likely to collaborate again. So what is the role of family support specialists in integrated care? Um, like Catherine said, my name is Karen Martinez. I'm the program director for the family support specialist team um, at Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, I'm actually a parent uh, of a child, and parent four times, and uh, I have three children with mental health needs. Um, I do know what it is, how to feel worried and frightened and confused and not knowing how to find help for my child and having lived experience has been a key role, um, a, a key actually function to providing effective uh, family support um, to, to a lot of the families that we serve and prior to Safety Net. Um, but family support specialists also need training and, and we need always ongoing training to tell our stories with purpose and intention um, and with boundaries as well. Um, and working as a family support specialist in primary care clinics also requires even more training, um, the things that uh, uh, Lindsay was mentioning. Um, so it requires ongoing training and flexibility as well. And our Thank you. Um, um, so the, what is a family support specialist role? The family support specialist own experience raising a child with emotional, behavioral, or mental health issues is critical for building a trusting and respectful relationship with families. Uh, the family support specialist supports a family's voice in the treatment engagement, including helping and make, helping them make informed decisions in behalf of their child and the whole family. The family super specialist also serves as a bridge, facilitating that communication between families and professionals uh, in plain language, I would say, uh, in both directions. Um, so the family support specialist also participates in family advocacy at, at the policy level um, to advocate for those changes that need to happen for families. 
Family support specialist aims to increase the strength and resilience of families to help their children with special needs achieve their, their full potential. Uh, they be uh, throughout uh, rapport building and sharing their stories to build trust. Family support specialist connects and supports parents and caregivers referred by primary care to have a voice and a choice in the whole process. Um, they create a, a safe environment in which families can speak honestly about their needs and frustration, just like uh, the case study that we, we shared, uh, case one. Um, we listen to the rest of the story, things that a uh, family may be less likely to say to clinicians. Um, they may be most likely to say it to a peer to peer supporter at that, at that point. Um, we help families construct an informed and family-driven care plan with individualized resources, resources that fit their family. So what's worked in the initial engagement process? Um, warm welcoming always works. Um, um, a welcoming introduction to the safety net study. Transparency, definitely, and including uh, the consent form, explaining that and answering those questions that families may have, um, parents may have, caregivers may have, and uh, listening carefully and sharing our stories uh, within that process as well. I am a parent. I, I can feel what you're going through. Um, we also uh, practice uh, cross-cultural sensitivity. And this practice requires delivering quality care to families who have diverse beliefs and attitudes and values and behaviors, even linguistically. Um, so, so we try to accommodate all that and we listen. Uh, yesterday I was in a training, yesterday was a session and, and one of the things they talked about was listening, listening and listening. So life domain tables is something that uh, we also use uh, in as a way to foster engagement. And I can talk about that a little bit. Uh, we use this table uh, to gather valuable family information uh, to be shared with the rest of the team. And that goes in the medical record. So this is our example of our, um, our sample of our family support tool that we use. We use this tool at the beginning when, um, well, when we were doing virtually at the beginning and now that we're doing face-to-face, -face, we sit with parents and we, we, we talk about family life, medical crisis, safety, what, 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 are, what do they have to say? Okay, great, so next slide, please. Thank you. So the family support specialist process uh, provides individual, individualized and a candid uh, family-driven support that respects the family's culture. And, and that's why we use our life domains table. Uh, we, we want to learn about those that culture and, and their values and their preferences and that equals out to an individualized uh, treatment. So um, we also help families make meaningful meaningful and sustainable connections to other families whenever we can through our referrals and uh, community um, um, resource as well. We introduce the families uh, to social activities and fun and recreation uh, for the whole family. Sometimes our families, uh, not all of them, but some of them uh, don't have fun in their life. That's not part of the equation for them. Um, maybe they're tired, overworked. Next slide, please. So this I learned very early on um, when I began uh, working as a family support specialist is how do we move families towards change? We, we do for and we do with and we cheer on. Very simple. <laughs> So families in crisis may be uh, right exhausted and overwhelmed and they might not know how to navigate uh, with so much attention going to one child. Parents may, may neglect their own needs and the needs of the children. So connecting around basic needs or first steps uh, are first steps to uh, accessing care and lets the family support specialists be a resource while also modeling self-behavior. 
self-care behavior. Uh, so doing with peer-to-peer uh, -peer support is prioritizing needs and reflecting on choices, guiding and coaching parents on how to do the action steps that might be needed, such as signing those consents for school for an IEP or seeking therapy. Uh, we join parents in looking up resources and, think, and thinking about uh, through whom they might want their child in, in their play, care planning team. Next slide. Cheer them on. A family support specialist guides and educates the family the process that encourages skill building and resilience. And uh, child's need may, at, in graduation, child's need may or may not uh, have changed, but information and self directed skills can give parents a new tool to manage those needs. Uh, let's be there to celebrate uh, the success of, of empowerment with our families. In summary, establishing an early connection with the parent is key to the process. Access uh, parents and um, care, uh, caregivers' readiness uh, at, throughout the whole process. Um, help identify possible barriers to accessing care. The family support specialist brings a family perspective in a timely manner to the clini clinical teams providing integrated care to children and families in primary care. A key team member, uh, the family support specialist builds trust and facilitates critical information sharing to and from family to support treatment recommendations. Lessons learned, ask, share, and celebrate. We ask parents about their accomplishments um, as you work with them. Ask what they feel they still help need, help with and offer to look relevant supports and never leave a family without a resource. Share your observations such as the gains you see or progress happening with the child or family. Also share good news uh, with the integrated team, success strengths teams and helps lessons stick. Celebrate the power of family helping families. And that is me. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Karen. That's always so inspiring. Um, um, this is just some numbers uh, for the numbers people out there. Uh, and also to give you an idea, even if you're not a numbers person, that there is data to support this. You can hear the way Karen described the work and the way Lindsay talked about it from their real life direct uh, service giving experience um, and the power behind their observations. But sometimes we're having to bring other kinds of information as all of you know to um, policymakers at local state or, or federal levels. And they are interested in stories but they also ask or data. So one of my roles and ambitions throughout this last decade or so has been to try to come up with um, incontrovertible evidence that this work that feels so right um, intuitively, as Karen describes it, and clinically, as Lindsay describes it, is also uh, yielding the same sets of results that these policymakers would like to see. So this is a study that was actually done. Um, there's a citation for it at the bottom of the slide. It's also at the end of these slides. And we can also be contacted about anything that we didn't get a chance to uh, go in more depth with you guys, thanks to our um, fire alarm excitement. Um, but um, we looked at access for kids in our clinical, our collaborative practice model versus kids in usual care. And, and we saw that um, not only did we have a higher percentage of kids in the collaborative practice model, seeing having their uh, evaluation happen, and that's a 91.5% um, versus 75.4%. And you may remember that these were kids who were actually more clinically, were, were sicker and had also other barriers such as language and, um, and culture. But so usual care was not seeming to reach those kids as well as this kind of model. And we had a pretty good success rate um, with getting people to come in for their evaluation. And the next bullet is about engagement. And, and for this one, 
it might be a little bit easier to interpret, that the kids who were in the collaborative practice model cohort were seven times uh, more likely to engage in the follow-up care, so not just the evaluation, but the treatment that was recommended after, than were the kids in the control group. So uh, if we are thinking from a healthcare policy and healthcare financing and overall equity and everything else that we're talking about these days, point of view, you would like to see, to see people get treated um, if they have a problem. And this is, uh, we're showing, okay, they're more, they're gonna, the, this kind of approach seems to work for six, increasing likelihood of people getting treated. But what else did we learn? Um, the outcomes and evaluation that we've done of the more recent um, uh, work it, through the ESOC study that came just before this current safety net study is another kind of collaborative practice model. It's different in that we, with ESOC, we were able to add um, the clinical social work role that uh, Lindsay's team does. So let's look at that. So those out for those kids, um, I can show you their actual statistics around that, the um, concepts I was just mentioning generically there for you. So for our, our intervention group use, which means the kids that were actually getting our, our study, our team's efforts, uh, were more likely to be um, kids of color, black or Hispanic, 61% um, versus 43% in the control group, and more likely to speak Spanish or Portuguese as a first language than English, and that's uh, 52 versus 32% difference. Also, the intervention youth had a greater number of mental health diagnoses at baseline, 42% versus 30% for the control. So um, already just that slide alone um, it points to barriers to care that are popping up in other places. So we were talking about kids that we could have been reasonably worried about getting treatment. In addition, we, uh, we are we're already focused, but increasingly focused on the role childhood trauma plays. And we're, uh, I think all of us are aware that childhood trauma often goes unrecognized, both within families and uh, by providers. And um, through learning about it sooner, we, uh, we can help with prevention and healing um, is our hope anyway. So uh, we are bringing the role, the, the idea of, of screening for ACEs into primary care. Lindsay's team uses a standardized measure that's noted at the bottom of the screen here to capture um, a count of ACEs as she described in those two case examples. And, and other people's research has shown that having three or more ACEs bring, puts people at high risk of poor outcomes. It's important to note from a resiliency point of view that it's not, um, it's not a guarantee, it's not predictive. People can still have better outcomes. Um, but it just means that there more uh, more needs to happen that go, that goes right to help uh, get those kids uh, and adults back on track. Within the safety nets uh, program that we are currently running, the average score we have is five, so uh, considerably more than three. And um, I, I guess the way we're looking at this is we are sorry for those kids and families and we are feeling like, okay, I guess we're reaching the families and kids who, who need us. Um, <laughs> uh, I can't read the very top there, but uh, I think it says, how did, we, how did they do? Okay, um, so we have, um, one of the things we look at is uh, risk of self-harm, suicidal ideation and and uh, an actual self-harm. And across all our um, race and ethnicity categories, we saw significant reductions in the total score of um, and likelihood of suicidal ideation. It measured both from baseline to six months and again from six to 12 months. Um, black youth in the intervention group or black boys um, had a an over 12 point um, reduction in the total self-harm score at 12 months compared to white children getting the intervention. And that's on a, on a scale that only goes up to um, 30. So that's a, a significant, as you can see, statistically significant uh, uh, decrease that, um, again, to clarify, because we don't have a graphic here, all the kids got better. The black youth started off with much higher scores with, of self-harm risk. And um, by the end of the year, they were at a um, 
they were at a comparable level of risk um, to um, the decline had been experienced by the white kids. So it, from the point of view of equity or disparities, we feel like there's a possibility, the opportunity to, uh, re to address that um, very well-known um, disparity in risk to, uh, to Black African-American youth, particularly boys. Um, and so the, I think natural thought would be, well, that's all very nice, but isn't that too expensive? It's certainly something I've heard a lot of times from people. Um, and one of the things that we're excited to report, and this is preliminary reporting, but is that pre and post our intervention, the overall cost of care and that psychiatric and pediatric combined increased less for the intervention youth compared to the increase for the control group youth. So it gave resulted in an average savings of $117 per child per month or around $1,404 per child per year. So it um, all care is expensive, but it looks like if we put in these kinds of um, intentional strategies for a particular uh, population, we um, it's actually has potential to save money. So the conclusions are that Building in the key role of family support specialists at the beginning appears to enhance family engagement, uh, helping to build and sometimes mend the safety net. Ongoing collaboration with the uh, PCP, I, the clinical care manager and child psychiatry consultant, helps clarify diagnoses and increase PCP awareness of and support for the individualized care plan. We, we go back to the docs all the time and ask them to weigh in, to speak to the parent, to, to, to say that they um, are on board. The, the clinical trial research studies such as we're doing um, also have the opportunity to um, contribute to the emerging evidence base on the value of peer-to-peer -peer parent support and team-based integrated care. The policy implications there are that um, the, this pilot data suggests that the clinical practice model has the potential to improve child mental health care access and engagement rates in populations at risk for disparity. That our early findings suggest savings in total medical expense. And an example of that would be, we have a uh, significantly lower emergency room use than the control group um, for the intervention use versus control. Meanwhile, that reduced time to treatment, finding kids in primary care, finding them earlier, could lessen the overall uh, morbidity of our illness burden of child trauma, as well as a lessen the risk for emerging mental illness. And if, if, those, if that's so, which it looks like it is, then this better quality care would more than pay for itself. Okay, so I know we don't have, we, we had a lot of diversions in there in terms of what we thought was our timing. I'm trying to get back how many minutes do we? Have so uh, we've been told by Kelsey that we can have a little extra time. Um, for all of you who didn't put in a chat but had a thought, this is your moment um, to raise your hand or chat or tell, ask questions. Of, you can ask Karen or Lindsay or me. Um, so we'd love to hear from you guys. Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, you can raise your hand on me if you wish, but we would probably do it one at a time, I think. Um, and I also want to say, I thought we put this in here, but I guess I must not have. Um, you have our contact info, though, because we all have our profile. So in the, um, in the conference uh, presenter profiles, we have emails. So if there's a particular question you have for Karen, and Karen, I got a question a, a couple of days ago uh, that I thought would be great for you from a grandparenting organization. They call them grand families. I don't know if that person's in this talk or not. Um, but um, so if you have a designated question for Lindsay or for Karen, you can obviously write to them directly. Uh, you can also write to me and I will try to answer. And if you don't know who to write to, and you can also write to Jen, I think her email might be there too. So um, We'd love to hear what other people, how this is similar or different from what you guys are doing where you are. If you have any thoughts.
Well, while we're waiting to see if people do have any thoughts, I don't know, Lindsay, did you have anything you might want to add? Since you had to get interrupted a few times um, to make sure that uh, people see how this might be different from other work. Um, no, I think I think that uh, the the picture at the start in terms of uh, I think the biggest difference, as you said at the beginning, is this all happens at one time. That that, that there's three team members: the psychiatrist, a social worker, and a parent to parent specialist working in unison with an entire with a with a family that's coming in with an identified kid. And so I do think that's a, that's very different than than most sort of either step care uh, models or, or um, different integrated care models out there. That's good. Hi, we, um, thank you. We have, uh, now uh, we're starting to get some, um, some interesting comments from people. So, so there's a, I'm looking quickly here, you guys. Thank you for writing to us. So within PNW, but I don't know what PNW is. What? Pacific Northwest. Pacific Northwest. Oh, all right. Um, so I'm hoping, Terry, I wonder if there's a way to tell us a little bit more about your program. And then we have a Southwest. Oh, this is great. Oh, so Terry, you're saying that you did tell us more. Oh, Washington State, definitely. Um, King County, I bet, right? You have a legacy of, um, of really excellent uh, system of care work. I've, I've been out to King County and talked to people about systems of care. Um, so you have some idea. I don't know if you have any um, thoughts about uh, things that you, you think are working well where you are or, um, or things you wish that you, you had more help figuring out um, whatever, however you want to let us know. Okay, so spoken. Mm -hmm. Pretty much the same. Is it working, Terry? Hopefully it is, Hope, because we want all the, all the good results we can gather. And uh, we also had a comment from Maritza. Um, Maritza, is there more you're going to tell us about where, um, what's similar or not similar? It sounds like, oh, I think that one of the exciting part, aspects of conferences like this is um, really the learning that we can do between programs and between uh, participants. So I hope that these, ki these kinds of connections can still go forward even when, you know, we will release you back to your afternoon and um, the conference continues. Oh, that's great. That's great to hear that the uh, Spokane experience is also a, a positive one. And I love the planting seeds idea. We, we talk about that too, right? Karen, maybe people aren't ready yet, but they get introduced the idea that it could work down the road when they're up, when they are ready. Um, well, um, I think I'll just let you connect with us uh, in whatever way you want, if you have follow-up thoughts. And um, otherwise, well, thank you so much for listening and putting up with our fire alarm. And uh, we will look forward to hearing from you guys and in, in other, other things that are going on across the, the rest of today. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Oh, Detroit. Yay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.